I'm um, Kathy Ewing, the director of the South Asia Institute here at Columbia. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's annual Mary Keating Das lecture um, to be presented by Professor Pratima Banerjee. Um, and I just want to tell you a brief bit about the, the lecture um, before we actually move into, into uh, usual proceedings. Um, this lecture was endowed by the Tarek Nath Das Foundation with the purpose of bringing a prominent scholar from South Asia to um, speak with the Columbia South Asia scholars and the broader community of scholars in the area. Um, of course, we're not limited geographically these days when we're online like this. So, um, I think we're well within the purview of the, of the um, intention. Mary Keating Das uh, was the wife of Tarek Nath Das and a founding member of the NAACP and the National Women's Party. She was um, uh, Tarek Nath Das's um, benefactor and after they married, they created the um, Tarek Nath Das Fund at several universities with the largest amount going to Columbia. Um, and so this is an uh, annual condition that we a tradition that we continue. Things have been a little bit different, difficult in COVID times, and, um, and we're hoping that by next year we'll be able to uh, resume the uh, tradition in its um, traditional way. <laughs> so, with that, I will um, turn things over to um, Anupuma Rao, who is Associate Professor of History at Barnard College and in uh, Misas um, here in Columbia. So, Anu, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy and Pratima. Thanks so much for being here with us. Um, it would, of course, have been really nice to have you in person, but uh, this is uh, this is good enough. Um, so my my job is really very easy and very pleasurable, which is to introduce Professor Pratima Banerjee. Uh, she's a professor at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi, and works at the cusp of history, philosophy and literary theory. Her books include The Politics of Time, Primitives and History Writing in a Colonial Society, published in 2006, and the recently published important text, Elementary Aspects of the Political Histories from the Global South, which was published by Duke University Press in 2020. She's currently working on a long durée history of idioms of social and political criticism in India, as well as shifting contours of democratic theory in the digital viral temporary. She is a fellow traveler um, who I've known for many decades now, I think it dates us all. Um, and her work, I think, is, is distinctive for being both deeply grounded in local traditions of scholarship, of thought, uh, working across language and language traditions, um, immensely theoretical, philosophical, I think I should say, and lucid and compelling. Uh, her talk today is uh, entitled Religious Criticism as Public Ethic, B.R. Ambedkar and His Contemporaries. Uh, April is Dalit History Month, and so it is um, with great pleasure that I welcome Pratama, and uh, Pratama, take it away. All right. Uh... This is uh, a great honor for me to be delivering this lecture. So first of all, deep gratitude to you, Kathy, and Anu and other colleagues for having me. Uh, and I am also uh, uh, very proud to be speaking in this month, the Talit History Month at Columbia. And uh, so let me just jump in. So here goes. Religion has never been a formal subject of study in post-colonial India. The fear that religious identities might split the nation asunder was so great at the moment of India's partition that the Indian Academy took an unstated policy decision to keep religion at arm's length. Unlike caste, which preoccupied sociology departments for decades. Departments of Islamic studies and Buddhist studies 
were of course part of many universities set up in the early 20th century by nationalist educators and left alone in post-colonial times as a conciliatory gesture towards minorities. But mainstream social science and humanities disciplines, especially political science and history, seemed to buy into the then widespread political reduction of religion to identity and or ideology with very little interest in the philosophical, phenomenological, and existential aspects of religion as they historically evolved in India. In other words, while the public life of religion remained and continues to remain a pressing concern, religion as such was never subjected to critical inquiry in the Indian Academy in the way that caste was, despite Ambedkar's strenuous efforts to put caste and religion within the same framework of analysis. In today's presentation, I give you a counter example to the modern Indian academies rather hesitant and reductive approach towards the study of religion. In early to mid 20th century India, a number of political thinkers debated religion outside the space of the academy and in the public sphere, somewhat aside of religion's remit as identity and or ideology, most notably B.R. Ambedkar, but also others like the philologist come textual exegete, come Buddhist convert, come Gandhian civil resistor Dharmanand Kosambi, the Vaishnava mendicant turned Vedic reformer, turned Buddhist itinerant, turned Marxist peasant league activist Rahul Sankrityan, and many others. This debate made visible, I suggest, what came to be unthinkable in modern times, namely the possibility of religious criticism as a valid public ethic. These thinkers disavowed the then hegemonic definition of religion as faith, that is, as a pre-critical acceptance of a doctrine or tradition, and argued that historically, the concept and content of religion has always been subject to critical thinking and reasoned disputation. They thus effectively cut through the faith versus reason binary, which seemed to besiege public discourses about religion in the modern world. So while historians, anthropologists, and political scientists labored to demonstrate the social accord and shared culture of different religious communities in India's past, in their effort to combat violent religious nationalisms, Ambedkar, Kosambi, and Sankrityan returned to pre-colonial traditions of religious encounters and disputations in order to propose not a circumscription of religion by secular reason, but in fact, a renewal of longer traditions of dissensus and disagreement internal to various religious traditions of South Asia. This debate about dissensus within and across religions is worth revisiting today. <laughs> 
when religious disagreement is either brushed under the carpet in the name of secular tolerance or reduced to geopolitical and or civilizational disputes between nations and peoples. Now, as you know, Ambedkar disputed the modern common sense that all religions shorn of superstitions, corrupt practices, and redundant rituals are essentially good at heart. This was not only Gandhi's position at the time, but also lay at the foundation of the secular constitutional principle that once pared down to so-called essential practices, all religions be approached including by the court of law, as valid, established, and therefore an unquestionable matter of worship or faith. Ambedkar, however, argued that religion was a historically changing entity, and therefore it was a logical and historical mistake, his phrase, to assume that there remains some kind of eternal, universal, and residual principle that inheres in religions across all changes in time and place. As we know, Ambedkar was arguing against not only his contemporary religious orthodoxy, but also religious reformers, nationalists, and those who, like the philosopher Radhakrishnan, who became India's first president, argued that religion was conceptually no different from a people's culture and or civilization. Criticizing Andrew Pattison's 1930 book, Philosophy of Religion, Ambedkar argued that the modern discipline of comparative religion was insufficiently philosophical because it engaged in cultural comparison but stopped short of religious critique. In his long counter essay, as it were, Philosophy of Hinduism, he argued that even though religion can be seen as being constitutive of the ontology of human life involving questions of birth, death, disease, destitution, and so on, religion was not, was never one thing. Because religion had gone through paradigm shifts in history, revolutions, he called them. However, secular reason's triumph over religion was not really the defining event of this story. Because the rise of science was an event, Ambedkar said, that was external rather than internal to the history of religion. To Ambedkar, the two most important events in the history of religion were, and this is well known, A, the invention of God, and B, the subsumption of morality under religion. Ambedkar argued that it was only in ancient, as opposed to archaic times, that the figure of God came to inhabit religion. The concept of God had extra religious origins, derived as it was from images of political figures like heroes, warriors, and kings. God was therefore incidental to and not constitutive of religion as such. Ambedkar also said that early gods, like early kings, had a relationship of kinship with humans, which was why competing polities had competing gods, 
often imagined as mother or father figures. In later times, when gods became transcendental, figures lying outside of political society, and society came to be imagined as made up of only humans, God came to watch over the individual's conscience rather than the civic life of the community. Henceforth, moral injunctions came to replace lineage loyalties. Once God became the addressee of the individual rather than the community, it became possible to imagine a polity composed of people worshipping different gods, just as it became possible to imagine a universal god overseeing a humanity divided into nations. A change of religion no longer implied a change in political belonging. Ambedkar was clearly arguing against the reduction of the religion question to the national question and saying that the right to religious criticism cannot be denied on the ground that a critique of religion was by default a critique of nation or race, as his detractors implied. Clearly, Ambedkar's was not a standard story of secularization and modernization, but a more complex story of changes in the relationship between gods and humans, politics and religion, and politics and ethics. In and about the same time as Carl Schmitt in Germany, Ambedkar in India seemed to be proposing a version of what we today recognize as political theology. Namely, the thesis that political society has a religious constitution at its core. There are, of course, two important differences between Schmidt and Ambedkar that we cannot forget. The first is that while Schmidt understood modern political forms like state, sovereignty, and law as secularized versions of older theological concepts, Ambedkar refused the religion-secularism binary in the first place and defined religion qua religion as a political formation. And two, unlike Schmidt, who worked with a unitary genealogy of Judeo-Christian concepts mutating into modern political concepts, Ambedkar worked with multiple religions. Hence, to him, the history of religion was always already a history of encounter, comparison, and criticism. Now, this is perhaps the reason why Conversion holds a pride of place in this debate. Conversion, not as a derivative or fringe matter of the spread of pre-constituted religions, but in fact as a constitutive aspect of religious being itself. Today in India and the world, Conversion has become about competing national identities at the cost of pre-colonial histories of inter-religious itinerancies and encounters. This unhappy history may prevent us from sensing the critical place of conversion in the thought of Ambedkar and his contemporaries, namely, that the eventual possibility of conversion worked as the enabling ground for rigorous religious criticism. Dharmanand Kosambi's autobiography details his spiritual quest, marked by penury and hardship on the road, in course of which he became an ordained Buddhist monk and yet, at the end of his life, 
went on to perform the Jaina ritual of Santara, or voluntary death by fasting. Sankrityayan became a Vaishnava monk, then an Arya Samaj reformer, and subsequently an ordained Buddhist mendicant, and even changed his name three times with each move. As fragments of his autobiography tells us, way before he publicly announced his intention to convert out of Hinduism in the mid-1930s, Ambedkar had already performed being a Muslim and a Parsi in early life in a shadow theater of conversion, as it were, in order to undertake public activities beyond his station as a born untouchable. In his book, Ghumakkar Shastra, The Science of Wondering, Sankrityayan exclaimed that caste practices prevented Indians from undertaking true epistemological, spiritual, and social itinerancy. He then went on to list religious thinkers of India in terms of their relative propensity to travel across new countries, peoples, and schools of thought, with Buddha and Mahavira at the very top because they took to the road and refused to stay bound by local experience, and the Bhakti saints who became local community leaders at the very bottom. Clearly, Ambedkar and his contemporaries drew on the pre-colonial itinerancy of Buddhist Parivrajakas and Jainayatis for whom going forth was enjoined calling. Unsurprisingly, Ambedkar structured his Buddha and his Dhamma book following Siddhartha's itinerancy first as a seeker and then as the Buddha traveling across countries to convert, Ambedkar's term again, convert kings, ministers, merchants, Brahmins, but also women, courtesans, untouchables, outlaws, with Ambedkar literally counting the miles that Buddha traveled on foot across Eastern and Northern India. Itinerancy across religions was therefore critical to these thinkers, reminding us that the history of religion is as much a history of mobility and encounter as it is of establishments and churches. Ambedkar's religious criticism therefore assumed the form of staged encounters between diverse schools of religious thought. In his riddles of Hinduism, he reconstructed pre-colonial religious debates between the Nyaya realists, the Mimamsa textualists, the Charvaka anti-foundationalists, the Vedantic non-dualists, the Buddhist atheists, and so on, focusing interestingly on technical epistemological questions, such as about the injunctive and illocutionary force of languages of command in normative texts, or about the textual heterogeneity of the Vedic uva which shows up its internal historicity as against its imagination of being unauthored and eternal, or about the foundational question of whether there can be a form of the real which is not cognizable but nevertheless existent. And most interestingly, in his other text, Who Were the Shudras, about the role of anumana or inference 
one of the conditions of veridical knowledge in classical Nyaya epistemology in the writing of what Ambedkar called, and I cite, imaginative and intuitive history, especially when the historical archive refuses to yield the voices of the outcast and the untouchable. Ambedkar's investment in religious criticism comes through equally in his rendering of the Buddha's encounter with various detractors in his quote-unquote Buddhist Bible, Buddha and his Dhamma, when he lays down in great detail disputes around older philosophies, which we do not talk about really anymore, such as of Akriyavada, the theory that individual action has no significant consequence for the collective, or Ananyavada, the theory of indestructible elements making up the world, or Uchedavada, annihilationism, their theory that everything perishes without remainder and was therefore inconsequential, or Vikshepavada, or a kind of skepticism that argued that the fundamentals of the world cannot be either proved or disproved, and so on. The point that I'm trying to make here is that Ambedkar actually spent many pages discussing in great detail these non-modern epistemological and metaphysical encounters, even if they did not immediately or seamlessly translate into a modern political language. The nature of Ambedkar's fidelity to pre-colonial traditions of debate and disputation has been overlooked by contemporary scholarship, which I believe rather too quickly arrives at Ambedkar's politics without attending carefully to his complex philosophical itinerary. Now, Dharmanand Kosambi and Rahul Sankritaya are different in social background and intellectual style as they were from Ambedkar and from each other, also wrote widely on pre-colonial religio-philosophical disputations. To save time, let me just take one example of Sankrityayan's discussion of the text Yoga Char Bhumi in his book Bodha Darshan. Though this circa 4th century compendium, Yogachar Bhumi, attributed to the philosopher Asanga, was primarily concerned with Buddhist meditative practices, it emphasized the virtues of discernment and discursiveness, vichar and vitarka, in the path to spiritual realization. Sankritayan dwells at length on Asanga's techniques of engagement with opponents and details the importance, as described in the classical text, of mobilizing for discursive efficacy arguments, examples, concepts, inference, experience, anubhava, tradition, and indeed, correct disposition involving the proper representation of opponents' views, polite, lucid, dignified delivery of speech, patience, generosity, and cessation and calm at the moment of defeat. Sankrityayan then goes on to describe the 16th thesis, which Yogachar Bhumi sets out to disprove, namely the existence of God, the existence of soul, the belief in eternity, the belief in past, future continuity, the belief in identity through time, and in the same paradigm, the belief in the superiority purity, 
and divine origin of Brahmins, as well as the belief that external actions, such as bathing in the Ganga or animal sacrifice, led to purity. Unsurprisingly, Beni Madhab Barua, one of the earliest historians of Buddhism in India, and Ambedkar Sr., revived in 1918 the Pali phrase, Sadha or reasoned faith, thereby cutting through the modern day faith reason binary, and used this phrase to characterize not only Buddhism and Jainism, but also a number of other schools of metaphysical and philosophical thought in early India. Now, recently historians have shown that religious criticism was very much part of not just scholastic, but also public life in pre-colonial times. Vincent L. Shinger and many others have shown that early Indian Buddhist arguments against Brahmanical dharma and the response to these anti-Brahmanical arguments by grammarians and mimamsakas were deeply argumentative and evidentiary in nature. This debate was about the possibility, or rather impossibility, of proving beyond reasonable doubt the conception, birth, and lineage of any individual. No evidence, whether visual experience or inference or authoritative testimony, could adequately vouch for the purity of birth claims that anchored the Brahmanical social theory of caste. In other words, what we have here is not only the Brahmanical social theory, sorry, not only a social critique of caste pride, though that too is part of the tradition, but a set of epistemological and ontological arguments about the nature of the veridical and the real. Unlike species difference, which could be epistemologically verified, the reasoning went, caste difference was simply convention. Ontologically speaking, caste was neither real nor universal to cite the emic terms of this ancient debate. Now, religious disputation in pre-colonial India, we should also note, went beyond the Buddhist Brahmin debate. And I can take many examples, most famously Akbar's court and the debate between the jurist Badawni and the politico Abul Fazl there, or in general, as Jonathan Brack has shown, the interreligious debate in Mongol courts across Central and South Asia, or for instance, in Southern India, the 12th century Shravana Belagola inscription which lists the public debates undertaken by Jain Digambaras, including by very famously the monk Vimalachandra, who took on many other schools of thought of his times in a letter affixed to the gate of the palace of the king in an uncanny reminder to Martin Luther's legendary act in 16th century Europe, and so on. I only mention these diverse historical instances of religious disputation in India in order to reiterate my argument that in non-modern times, religious criticism did have a public and political life and that religion was not imagined as we do today as a domain beyond philosophical and epistemological inquiry. So the early and mid 20th century debate that I have described for you was Jainas faced. Opening onto the question of sociability on the one hand and onto the more abstract set of questions 
regarding the nature of reality, causality, veracity, and materiality on the other. Needless to say, the terms of this debate was distinct from the modern academic study of religion. Modern disciplines frame the question of religious being in terms of the binaries of identity and community, individual and society, private and public. But in this debate, the question was that of sociability, concerning the relationship of individuals across social boundaries. Because at stake here was not only multiple religions, rather than religion as a universal or generic concept, but also multiple societies following Ambedkar's description of India as a nation consisting of a hierarchy of social groups sans sociability. That is, India as a society of societies, as it were. The sociability question here thus exceeded the question of the relationship between the individual to society, the anthropology of religion question, or the individual to herself or to the state, the political philosophy question. For here, the sociability question had to do, as, it was, as was inevitable in a multi-religious and multi-social context such as India, with the concrete encounter of one person with another across social boundaries. In other words, what comes through in this debate is that not only that religions are multiple, but that religions are incommensurable in the way that they variously posited the horizon of sociability. And religions variously posited the horizon of sociability because they variously imagined the nature of the world and the place of the human in it. Said differently, religious criticism entailed phenomenological, ontological, and existential criticism, and by implication, social criticism. Here, the religion question retracts from the social to the pre-social, or to put it differently, from the historical question of the evolution of society and state, which too did concern Ambedkar and his contemporaries, especially when all of them thought religion and Marxism together, it retracts from the historical question to what I call the archaic question of the nature of reality and materiality. Here I use the term archaic in its classical twin connotation. The archaic, on the one hand, has to do with the originary principle in itself historically undemonstrable but generative of subsequent historical formations, the place of the concept of shunya or emptiness is just such an archaic moment in the thought of Ambedkar, Kosambi, and Sankritayan. On the other hand, the archaic has to do with the primary act of command and therefore the institution of political form. And here caste appears as that conceptually antecedent moment of the constitution, distribution, and administration of bodies, which are otherwise indistinguishable from each other in terms of surface markers, as in race, or in terms of biological constitution, as in sex or species. So then, Sanskritian's long essay, Buddhist Dialectics, emphasized put the Buddhist concept of shunya, or eternal flux, namely the archaic principle that no entity in the world is stable, eternal, or foundational. 
and he presented Shunyavad, as did Ambedkar, in opposition to quote-unquote realists who believed that the world was composed of immutable elements and foundationalists who saw the world as grounded in an ultimate reality like the universal self or in our terms, in modern terms, nature. In fact, Shunyavad proposed that the world was composed of not objects, vastus, but events, dharmas, and proposed a theory of time as a discontinuous series of moments with a very different notion of causality. In his Buddha and his Dhamma and his 22 vows for conversion, Ambedkar too, interestingly, incorporated these apparently difficult and abstruse concepts of shunya and causality as dependent origination, even though these texts were meant for popular edification, and even though these concepts did not easily translate into the modern language of politics. In his discussion, uh, how much time do I have left, uh, Anu? Um, I, I think you can take what you need, but give us maybe about 20, 25 minutes for, for comments and conversation. Sure. So I'll try to finish in about five minutes. Is that okay? Five to ten, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. So, in his discussion of Vishuddhi Magga, the path of purification, Buddha Ghosh's fifth century treatise on Buddhist spiritual practices, Dharmanand Kosambi spoke of the discipline of Kayagata Smriti or awareness of the body. Body awareness not only led to an overcoming of desire, hatred and sloth, but also showed up the body as a structure of bones indistinguishable from the bodies of others, leading to a phenomenological realization of equality. Then followed the discipline of Maitri or friendship in ever expanding circles with the love for the self, love for humans, love for quadrupeds, love for reptiles, and eventually love expanding to all possible species of the planet. Then followed the discipline of Prithvimandal or the earth visualization that required one to focus on the materiality of the world, including surrounding objects like land, water, animate and inanimate objects and light. Clearly at stake here was the, an imagination of religious being that required the individual to both partake in and separate from the world, to simultaneously attend to and deconstruct the apparent givenness of body, sense, language, thought, experience, and indeed community. In Buddha and the Dharma, Ambedkar too speaks of meditative practice, mental focus, and cognitive purity as essential states enjoined by Buddhism, producing a form of individuation that enabled one to subject habit, custom, culture, and tradition to critical questioning. And yet, this critique had to be modulated and moderated not only by dispositional equanimity in public life, compassion and friendship, but as importantly, a commitment to the understanding of reality as flux and causality as non-linear and non-deterministic. 
Only thus could one avoid, Ambedkar said, the pedantry that marked both Brahmanical knowledge and modern scientific knowledge, and the determinism that marked modern political ideologies like Marxism. Needless to say, this archaic or pre-social question of the materiality of the world, of temporality and reality, did not sit well with modern theories of history. Marxist intellectuals of the time, who thought seriously about religion, such as Devi Prasad Chattopadhyay, Y. Balarama Murthy, and the Hindi literateur Ram Vilas Sharma, disputed Sankrityayan, Kosambi, and Ambedkar precisely on this. Thus, even while showcasing the uncanny similarity between Engels's origin of family, private property, and state, and the Buddhist origin myth of kingship as found in the Digha Nikaya, Chattopadhyay expressed his unease with the Buddhist position that reality was provisional and subject to unrelenting flux. Balarama Murthy, too, said that the position that reality was real only within limits disabled historical imagination and engendered what he called relativism of Ambedkar and others. And Ram Vilas Sharma accused Buddhism of lacking any theory of the universal, for according to Buddhist ontology, time was discontinuous. And time appeared only as a series of particular and incommensurable events. Sharma expressed his preference for a Nyaya epistemology, which held that time, space, and elements of the world were real, and so on. So let me rest my case here. I have tried in this presentation to offer a set of revisionist arguments for your consideration. One, I have proposed that we read Ambedkar not only as a critique of caste or a social and political critique, but also as a serious philosopher, historian, and critic of religion, both as concept and as history, as one who proposed in the name of religious being an ontology of human thrownness in the world, to use a Heideggerian turn of phrase, without the guarantee of either God or progressive laws of history and chronological succession. Two, I proposed that instead of holding on to Ambedkar's exceptionalism, we read him in association with his contemporaries. And that does, that does not mean just Gandhi. Many of whom, like Ambedkar, thought Marxism and religion together and open up the question of the limits of history and the question of the pre-social and the archaic. Three, I have also proposed that instead of seeing Ambedkar as he is currently seen as an inexorable modernist, we recognize that he was part of a community of public intellectuals who critically engaged pre-colonial philosophical and metaphysical traditions in order to reanimate in unprecedented and unrecognized ways modern political languages of equality and fraternity, and thereby made possible religious critique as a public ethic. For I have also proposed, though somewhat implicitly, that we learn from this mid 
20th century public debate and consider instituting the critical study of religion in South Asian universities and colleges instead of leaving religious education to pundits and ulamas and simply bemoaning the pernicious forms that religious disputes have assumed in contemporary public life. And finally, and five, I have proposed that instead of imagining religion as a universal or generic category, as we do within the disciplines of political philosophy and anthropology, we study religion as emerging out of encounters and disputations around multiple traditions and indeed around the very question what the concept of religion is in the first place. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thanks so much. Um, there is lots and lots to um, consider and take up, I think, in this fabulous talk. Um, I, I think the floor is open if, uh, and as people gather their thoughts, let me say a couple of quick things that, that came to mind. Um, you know, Ambedkar is, is certainly always, in a sense, uh, located between the past and the future, right? And, and the fact, indeed, that he doesn't have Sanskrit, just to think about, um, think about him autobiographically, and the kind of enormous desire to access that past from which he has been excluded, excommunicated, um, is, is so significant for him. So I think you know, much of what you're saying resonates almost implicitly, I think, for many of us who are reading and rethinking uh, Ambedkar, there are a couple of things that quickly came to mind. One, um, the points that you're making about sociality, um, I would love for you to say a little bit about um, what you think about Aniket Zaure's work in practice and caste, and the argument there also about societies of inheritance, societies of acquisition, and there too a kind of argument about stripping down to the body as a kind of bag of bones, if you will. And then, in some sense, scaling up, rethinking, in some sense, the questions of caste and enfleshment. And I would love to just hear you say um, something about that. Um, I think many questions to be asked here as well about Buddhism, Marxism, but also the colonial discovery of Buddhism, the kind of standard historicist arguments, mm -hmm. uh, which I think you're refusing and refuting. But I'd still like to ask you um, how that colonial rediscovery of Buddhism affects the ways in which we're thinking equality, Buddhism, and Marxism. And finally, there seems to be something um, profoundly regional, if I can put it that way, in terms of the way that Southern and Western India maintained long traditions of Jainism, Buddhism. One could go back to the Fule, uh, who is thinking in a sense of Shunya, Shunyavad uh, in, in the last works too. But there's something about the, the long histories of Buddhism as sort of Dalit religion, if you will, that I think Ambedkar is also picking up on. And this is quite distinctive and different from uh, the Kosambi, the father, certainly, and Sankithyayan. And so if you could just, you know, uh, say something about, uh, about uh, some of these uh, issues, but uh, I'll hold um, my questions and you don't need to respond right now at all. We can take a few more questions maybe and then have you respond. Hi. I, it, it's hard for me to... Uh... Hi, Pramod here. Uh, yes, please, uh, Pramod. Prathama, do you mind if we gather a couple of uh, a yes, couple sure, of absolutely, yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see people too. Yeah, thanks, Pramod, for showing yourself. Hi, hi. Uh, thank you for a uh, very interesting pro uh, proposition. My question is: uh, uh, with coming of an, a colonial critique of an, a religion and caste, one of the Indian intellectual response was to look at an ancient India. Okay, 
uh, even the caste hindus response was a go back and see at an ancient india do you think there is a similarity in a ambedkar's response one how do you see uh, ambedkar's engagement with an islam where equality and fraternity are very central uh, argue uh, central uh, th- uh, central concept where ambedkar really try to think about and his other contemporary like periyar or his senior phule both have a very interesting uh, view about islam so how do you uh, place islam in a whole discussion uh, about religion thank you thank you pramod um could i ask a question partho uh yes partho can can you uh, can you hang on for one second uh yes. shauna has got a question and then partho and then we'll collect those and uh, give pratima a chance to respond if that's okay yeah thank you thank you anu uh thank, thank you professor chatterjee uh, and thank you uh professor banerjee uh, it was a extremely interesting talk uh, and there's so much to think through but i have three questions so i'll try to keep it short um the first is about um um how ambedkar approaches religion uh, as a category um does he always approach it as a category that is whole and that has to be approached as a whole or does he approach it in a disaggregated manner and does the encounter that he sees within religions in india uh are they limited to the non modern world or does it extend to the encounter that constitutes his historical moment uh that particularly uh between uh modern conceptions of islam uh and uh, conceptions of uh religion in um in the nationalist movement or the anti colonial movement uh my second question is also on sociality um and how um is it the emphasis on sociality in ambedkar's thinking that makes him emphasize religion as a mode of um uh, thinking through principles uh rather than through rules um if religion is rule based then the ethical practices of the self that it would inculcate in people could be distinct from the social practices required from forms of social cooperation communication association that are important to ambedkar so is his emphasis on sociality what leads to his distinction between a religion of rules and a religion of principles now finally my question is on uh, ambedkar's own views on religion as moving through a transition and he makes this very clear when he writes on the philosophy of religion he often portrays religion through a transition debate um did the marxists that he was engaging with or who one can view as his interlocutors acknowledge this way of thinking in ambedkar and how do we resolve this mode of thinking with his later engagement with buddhism yeah, thank you thank you partho uh thank you prathama uh i uh, i have uh, i have two two points to make one is i was a little uh unsure of your of the claim you were making that uh, in the uni- indian indian universities in the sort of 20th century or after independence there was no study of religion i don't think that's quite correct because um, you certainly you wouldn't have found it in the political science departments because those those were completely useless uh but uh, departments like some history historians and a lot of the work that was done in literature and language departments had to do with there's a vast array of work on the various sectarian movements the so called uh, bhakti movements uh, on pilgrimages on temple towns festivals etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a whole array of work that continued to be done it's still being done uh, and first there was the anthropology of religion right now what is what is interesting is that none of this work 
would engage in what you are calling religious criticism. Because that I think is a methodological premise of the Western Academy. That even in the Western universities, even today, you even have religion departments. But the premise is that you take an academic, that is to say, an outsider's position, and you do not engage in an insider's criticism of religion from within the tradition, right? So I think that's the premise of the Indian universities. Now, the interesting question is this. Uh, do the moderns engage in religious criticism from the inside? And here I would like to uh, make, um, this is a question that's often occurred to me. I don't completely know the answer because I've, I've tried thinking about it over the years that I've read Ambedkar. Uh, what's the difference between Ambedkar's uh, approach to religion and for instance, those of people like, let's say Ramon Rai or Dayanand Saraswati. Now this is 19th century, okay? Uh, they engage in religious criticism in, in heavy disputation, right? But all within a perfectly understood and established tradition of disputation, right? I mean, Ramon Ra does this with Islamic scholars, with uh, obviously Brahmin scholars, uh, so does uh, Dan, right? They engage their position, so it is arguable that that is an internal critique which they were carrying on, leading to the foundation of completely separate religious sects, such as the Brahma Samaj or the Ari Samaj. What is Ambedkar's position here, right? Now at one level, I do think Ambedkar's, a great deal of his writing would in fact be perfectly consistent with a liberal, secular, modern position, right? But as you very correctly point out, this was not all. That Ambedkar then does go on to develop this, this, this approach, which is engage in religious criticism. Now the question is, and this is my question to you. Can one say, even when Ambedkar is writing Buddha and Islamma, right? Is the point of the critique, is it an internal critique? Or is the position of the critique coming from an external source? Right? Because this is something that has often bothered me, that Ambedkar is claiming what is quite revolutionary, a new, new yana, a, a new vehicle of Buddhism. Right? In, in fact, from all we know about what he's done, to the, it's a completely invented religion. And yet he does not do this by engaging in disputations, as far as I know, uh, engaging in disputations with other Buddhist scholars, with traditional Buddhist scholars, there's no such thing. As far as I know, most of his knowledge of Buddhism comes from English translation, right? So this is my uh, question then to you. I mean, what is, how do we uh, take Ramon's uh, clear position of religious criticism, but is that detachable from his secular modern intellectual upbringing? Thanks, Partho. Uh, Pratima, we're going to give you a chance to, to respond to just yes. these minor, small questions. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And this is like really, uh, in fact, these are the questions, most of these are questions that I'm struggling with in this, uh, in, in this write, write up that I'm preparing. Uh, let me, um, let me start with the big question about where, to, which is kind of common to many of the questions, but which kind of was formulated by Parthoda quite uh, pithily by asking, was Ram Ambedkar like Ramon Roy and Dayanand Saraswati an insider to a longer tradition of religious disputes? Or was he like us, external, uh, you know, external critics of history of religions? It seems to me that there is no clear answer to this, that part of the rightly said, he is doing both. And he is doing both for two reasons, as far as I can see. One, because as Anupama pointed out right at the beginning, he 
was not a natural insider to any tra all these traditions because of his inaccess to the classical languages um, like Sanskrit, despite his attempt to learn it and despite his attempt to learn Pali. And two, because he, in, in the public sphere, he was, while discussing matters with, uh, indeed, Buddhist think, thinkers of his contemporary, and he did engage in some disputes with uh, uh, the Nepal and the Tibetan and the Sri Lankan uh, Buddhist establishments, uh, he was also talking to religion as nation as it had emerged by the 1940s. So therefore, he also had that language of liberal secular uh, very often. Now, in terms of uh, the question of the longer history and writing of the history of um, religion in India, it is quite right that history departments, literature departments, and sometimes philosophy departments, philosophy departments being very marginal in, universe, in Indian universities, by the way, did work on uh, you know, popular religious traditions more often than on the, the more abstract philosophical traditions. At the same time, it's interesting to note here that unlike another strand of recovery of Buddhism in this time, which was the, the path through popular religiosities that many other thinkers took, such as Beni Madhav Barua, whom I mentioned right now, but also very famously somebody called Haraprasad Shastri, um, who did ethnography and found uh, disguised Buddhist practices amongst untouchable communities in multiple remote corners of Bengal, Orissa, and the finding of Jaina, secret Jaina traditions, or uh, traditions of Buddhism and Jainism which had taken a tantric form and therefore had become esoteric and cult-like. So there was this other strand of recovering uh, longer histories of uh, religious disputations at the popular level. So the, f the fight between the tantric Buddhists and the tantric Shaivites, for instance, was another form of disputation that was pretty much on. And uh, this brings me back to Pramod's uh, question, in which Islam also had a part to play. Uh, you know, East Bengal, for instance, the space where popular forms of Islam including hybrid forms of uh, Islam come quote-unquote Hindu uh, esoteric practices, Buddhist esoteric practices, and you know, Shaivite and Vaishnava esoteric practices engaged in disputes and debates, which symbolically took the form of various gods and untouchable kings and queens fighting each other. So there was that story that is, that, that is there which one needs to also talk about, and I've been trying to read up on that as well myself. But interestingly, Ambedkar very self-consciously steps aside of the popular religion question. And I have a thought on why he does so, and why he sticks to the philosophical mode of uh, religious disputation rather than the more uh, symbolic and uh, kingly mode of religious disputations. But I'll set that aside for the moment. Um, um, and connected to that question of why popular religiosity was not to Ambedkar's interest, and he was he pretty uh, explicitly talked about why, for instance, Chokha Mela's uh, 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 critique uh, is contaminated by you know Hindu uh, Brahmanical uh, uh, principles and so on and so forth. One of the reasons is very clearly points to what Shona is saying, which is that Ambedkar actually chose the religion question to speak to the individuation question, and not the question of the formation of alternative communities or countercultures. Even though we might think that for him, Buddhism would be a kind of counter identity for Dalits, and it may have become so in, in course of the years, but very clearly, Ambedkar is arguing against the counterculture part towards religious criticism, because this is precisely 
for fear that a countercultural or a counter community path might reinscribe the already e existing segregation and separation of untouchable communities from mainstream society. Which is why for, for him, the emphasis was of individuation and the cultivation of an ethical and critical disposition. Um, you know, so therefore, all the talk about, um, and Shailaja Paik's work, for instance, about his many speeches to uh, mass meetings, where basically the argument would be to remove all forms of visible symbols of a counterculture from the body of, of the Dalit. And the, the Im emergence of the Dalit as an individual, not as the not as the locus of a private faith, that he was very critical about, but the locus of, as Kosami would say, an ethical individuation that both attended to one's being in the world, but also deconstructed things like community experience and language. And emergence of a critical subject as an individuated subject a subject of principles and interpretative subjects rather than a rule bound subject is what Ambedkar was talking about. Um, uh, the Islam question promote is very, very complex and difficult. And I tried partly responding to it. And in, his, in, in many of the tracts of Ambedkar, especially where he discusses conversion, 1930s, 40s, um, he actually very clearly compares and contrasts uh, how Islam, as opposed to Brahmanical Hinduism, how, as opposed to Christianity, allows different kinds of socialities. Uh, at the same time, there are quite a few mentions in Ambedkar's oeuvre of the persecution of Buddhists in the hands of Muslims as well. So the Islam question is a complex question. And and his thoughts on Pakistan is another text that should be studied, uh, uh, you know, against the grain. To add. so, Pramod, I totally take your question on board, but I don't think I can give an adequate answer. Uh, I think I'll probably stop here for the moment because, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's not an adequate response, but nevertheless. Thanks, Fatima. We've got. Um, I think um, Ajay's got a question. Um, and, and I, I did want to also, if I may, ask you to say a little bit more on this question of geohistories, the Islam question, but also the Buddhism, Brahmanism, and the argument about revolution, to come back to the question of history, historicizing, and um, ethical personhood on the one hand, and then the kind of structure of the event, which is also very important for Ambedkar, right? So there's another kind of a history of events of humiliation, of the um, challenge to Buddhists, um, and so on and so forth. So um, I do wonder if you could say a bit more, but Ajay, please uh, jump in. Sure. Uh, thanks, Prathama, for a characteristically thought-provoking and wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, there are so many questions I'd like to ask, but I'll just begin with one for now. Uh, and maybe if there's time, we can come back to others, uh, which is, you know, you made a very strong case and a very persuasive case uh, for not imagining religion as a universal or generic uh, category, right? Uh, but as emerging out of disputations around multiple traditions. But as we know, I mean, you know, a concept also has boundaries, right? Uh, so. I suppose what I'm interested to hear, hear you say more about is uh, what allows in your vocabulary some activities to be classified as religious, right? Uh, given that we don't have a universal category, which I'm completely with you on, right? But uh, so I'm just, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and what allows others to be not thought this way, so to speak. Yeah, so that's just a, that's it, I think. Pratima, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, 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 the question. Uh, let me start with, I'll, I'll let me put Ajay's question later because that's the tough one and I don't have an answer actually uh, to confess. Uh, but nevertheless, um, 
Uh, anu, uh, yeah, Anu, right. And Shauna, both of you asked me about the, the question of historical transitions uh, in Ambedkar's thought. And especially in, 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 he's talking about revolutions in the history of re uh, religion at a time when, amongst Marxists, the transition debate is at its peak. And you are quite right. And Ambedkar implicitly and sometimes explicitly references the question of transition. And one of the most poignant moments where, uh, where, in some senses, uh, uh, Ambedkar and his contemporary Marxists come apart is, trans is, is at the moment of the future, right? Uh, in his Buddha or Karl Marx, uh, Ambedkar asks the question of, the, of a boom of what happens when the state finally withers away. And according to him, the Marxists do not have an answer because the Marxists, Engels, and following him many others, begin with the story of a pre-state uh, social formation. Uh, prim they, some of them call it primitive communism. And many of these Marxists actually talk of early Buddhism as a pre-state formation, a formation of the time of uh, confederate clan polities rather than state. And in fact, D.P. Chattopadhyay, who's a committed Marxist, um, argues that Buddhism talks about dukkha or uh, human suffering precisely because it is witness to the war between emerging monarchical states uh, based on private property and agricultural revenue, and these pre-state, pre-agricultural confederate polities. So Marxists start from a pre-state moment and promise a post-state moment after communism, when the, after the dictatorship of the proletariat, when the state withers away, humans administer themselves as an immanent self-governing mode of being. Uh, a kind of quote unquote, and uh, Faisal Devji has interesting things to say about a number of people at this time, uh, including, he, he also names Gandhi, Ajay is here and he will respond to this again, but also somebody like Modudi, uh, all imagining an immanent way of self -governan governance in which society governs itself via ethical principles rather than through a state, which Fazal would calls a kind of anarchic uh, 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 moment uh, in history at this time, which is missed out because we focus too much on the classical Marxist form. So Ambedkar goes on to say that, that the last moment is where Marxism falls through. And he says that when the state withers away, what is left as a residual principle is dhamma, or religion. Religion without a transcendental entity, like the state or a god. Right, so in some senses, the transition debate kind of takes on two very different connotations, despite overlaps on the middle, uh, on the kind of, you know, middle part of that debate. So I think that's a very, very interesting uh, thing to think about about the Im about the thinking about immanent self-governing modes of being of human society, and one would say if one takes Kosambians and Kritayan more seriously, interspecies living as well. Now, to go from there to Ajay's difficult question. Now, this is a question that uh, has been asked of me. Uh, multiple times regarding my recent book on elementary aspects of the political, where I end up in some senses deconstructing, uh, disassembling uh, the political into you know various um, self-contradictory forces or contradictory forces which pull apart from each other and implode the political as it were. And then I have been asked. So is there a residual definition of political in your mind? Or have you, in some senses, given up on the concept of the political? Now, again, I mean, <coughs> obviously, I have not given up on the, I cannot give up on the 
category that I called uh, political for obvious reasons, and yet I postpone its definition as it were. Or rather, uh, I, I arrive at it as in its, in, in its moments of impossibilities as it were at moments where it fails, where it come, comes into crisis, and so on and so forth. Now, am I saying something similar about religion? Again, for prejudicial reasons, I am probably better able to function without a concept of religion than I'm able to function with a concept of politics. But that is the pathos of our generation, right? So, in a provisional way, if do I, if, what is religion then? I, you know, I have two thoughts, which again, I don't know, very provisional, take it with a bucket of salt. One, something that is beyond what can be, what again, again, something drawing from the older debates that Ambedkar himself recreates. Things that are, that cannot either be proved or disproved and yet drive our lives uh, is one horizon where religion erupts or what we recognize as religion erupts or what we call the pre-social creaturely condition of being. And in my book, I actually try to argue that the pre-social creaturely condition of being is addressed by two uh, thought forms. One is religion, but the other, interestingly, is economics, which disavows all political, cultural, social distinctions in the name of the pre-social and the creaturely, except it does not quite enter the species question, which I think religion does better. Uh, so I don't know whether I'm being able to give you a sense of where so social criticism, political criticism, yes, but there is something which remains. I mean, I call it archaic in some, at some points, but I call it pre-social at other points, uh, or uh, on the borders of demonstrability um, uh, or uh, creatureliness at, at other points. So that is that. I mean, I really have nothing more profound to say. So sorry on this. Pratima, could I, I mean, could I just maybe pick up on that for a second? Um, so what happens to caste? <laughs> I uh -huh. guess is the question. I mean, if we come back to this question of the boundaries of religion and where this lies, there's an important argument that Ambedkar clearly is also making about the relationship between religion and religions and, and their agonistic relationship with each other on the subcontinent and caste as a certain kind of social form. So now what happens, I suppose, to caste um, to come back to, to that kind of fundamental? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So uh, at, a, at, at a kind of obvious level in Ambedkar's arguments about religion, it's very clear that the way sociality sociability is prohibited between persons of different religions is exactly the same as it is prohibited between persons of different castes in other words in terms of prohibitions on commensality and sexuality and touch and so on and so forth at the same time he would he also explicitly states that it is caste which prevents inter-religion itinerancy because it dis disallows people from you know experiencing different modes of religious being precisely because they are affixed to their caste beings but that uh, that is a kind of more direct response to what you're saying the, the point that I'm trying to make here more strongly is that beyond this obvious level, the question that strikes me is that what compels Ambedkar in order to offer a critique of caste to go into the question of, let us say, Shunyavad, right? Or the question of 
flux or the and so on and to me the question becomes and to refer back to your first question on aniket jawari's book i think there is in ambedkar an attempt to think through the caste question at also at, at a phenomenological level and not just what i'm calling a social level in other words where the question of bodies of the body's mortality and uh, you know decrepitude destitution uh the question of what happens uh when you know uh, untouched and in your own work and for instance when you talk about the question of the archaic in a ritual sense about the sacrifice of the untouchable body body at the foundation of a fort or a village right in your own caste question those questions where where does the untouchable's body and flesh and so on and so forth that question which is which jawaris talks about in his book but also somebody like uh, sundar sarukai uh, in his phenomenology of touch he basically the argument about you know cutting through the social question and arriving at the at the unmediated question of body on body or body against body uh in violence or body on body in sexuality and accidental touch above all um so so that's some that's where ambedkar is seeking to go now it is very clear that he's being pulled back because the modern language of politics does not admit to these concerns as it were which turn out to be too ontological or whatever you whatever term you may use and i and so i i do think that that aspect of ambedkar's work uh including also the deeply personal aspects of his life for instance you know the story of kisa gotami approaching the buddha with his dead with her dead child in his arms and ambedkar's letters after losing well, four out of his five children uh the 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 deeply intimate question of the cruelty of time and life uh, things which as as i was asking i mean things which which push us to religion but uh for a person like ambedkar or you and me or so many others uh we are not that hospitable to religion either but nevertheless these questions press themselves on us and i think that's the aspect that and it is therefore deeply deeply connected to the question of body and touch and intimacy and death and destitution of body destitution being another word that aniket jawari used to great effect uh in his work on dalit literature uh you know um so so you know i i hope i'm being able to give you you know share where i'm trying to go without fully being able to formulate it this is fabulous thank you i um we're nearly out of time i think we have a couple of minutes um ajay in case you wanted to respond or pratima if you wanted to take a chance just to um and i think kathy's got um her her hand up so um kathy please go ahead Okay, um thank you. And this is an amazing talk. It just got me thinking in in so many ways that um it's hard to know where to begin. Um but um I couldn't help see I actually just wrote something responding to Marshall Solins's uh new new book, posthumous book on uh uh the new science of the rest of humanity and uh a kind of his universalizing of immanentism um and the he he really doesn't take into account you know sort of some of these traditions of of thought so i'm not i'm not going to address directly the you know the the complexities of the um um bedker um issues that you presented so wonderfully but um i'm coming kind of out of that context and also out of the context of thinking 
uh, in my earliest training through McKim Marriott's um, efforts to, I would say, come up with a different ontology of um, drawing on some of these tradi traditions, but very much from within the anthropological um, mode. And you mentioned it in kind of passing, you know, sort of what, what anthropologists were doing, but I just wonder, um, you know, when we, when we think about, uh, so Marriott was a, his infamous cube and the idea of persons as particles of flowing substance and therefore contact across caste would be um, contaminating. Um, and so, um, so I just, I just wonder where, whether, um, and, and I think that, that kind of, you know, at, at Chicago, where that was really the way to think about India um, in the, in the seventies. And then we have the move towards um, history. I think that become it, within anthropology that becomes um, much more central as, as, and, and now of course we have the, the question of what are the um, political effects of uh, an approach like Marriott's. So that's why I was, I was so um, intrigued by what you're bringing up um, in terms of um, this, the way that these sort of pre-colonial philosophies were um, being engaged. Um, so I just, th those are the thoughts that are going through my head. So I'm just wondering if you have, um, you know, anything to say about <laughs> any of that. <laughs> okay, thank, thanks, Kathy. I, 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 I totally get where you're coming from. Interestingly, in our own, as we kind of uh, studied, uh, uh, I mean, I'm a, a historian by training, but naturally all of us grew up reading uh, Mackie Marriott and then, you know, uh, uh, you know, of course, Louis Dumont later, and then Nicholas Dirks much later, and in the middle, Ronald Linden. So there has always been this tension between the imagination of, of what we call the caste system. Uh, now, there is, of course, a historical question on whether there has always been something systemic, uh, uh, whole and systemic about caste. That's an, another question. As caste system, as a kind of immanent, uh, self-governing mode of society, and between people who argued that caste is most importantly to be thought in terms of kingship. That is as deeply in, in, in entrenched in the political form of kingship and kingly governance via, let us say, land grants to Brahmins or, uh, you know, the Brahmin as a kind of mode of, uh, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and, and the widespread coming of Brahmadeyas or Brahmin land grant exempted, uh, tax exempted land grants to Brahmins across India, which create them into a kind of counter political power to the Kshatriya king. And the Kshatriya historically could very well be a Shudra, who was just called Kshatriya because by a quite political power. And so, so that that tension between seeing caste as a social system and between seeing caste as a political system has always, in some senses, beset the academic study of caste in the Indian context. If you ask me personally, I actually tend to lean a little more on the kingship story, uh, towards the kingship uh, side of the story. Also, apart from any other thing, also because we have actually large number of instances of not only Shudra kings, that is pretty well known, but also instances of what are called untouchable and outcast kings in history. And in other words, the political principle and the ritual principle being locked in a kind of phase off, I think now the ritual principle is not necessarily the religious principle in a large sense, right? But that, that face off seems to, to me, I may be wrong, but it seems to me to be a driving force 
of what becomes by the early modern times, and many historians would actually argue that it is in the early modern times that what we call systemically caste comes into being. Prior to that, what we call caste is a far more combated and besieged and contested formation. So, so you know, there is something to be thought in, in terms of that face-off between, you know, social, the social and the political as, in some senses, becoming a binary in the way that we imagine the question of religion. And, you know, where does it, where is its locus? Is it, you know, the, is it society or actually in, in the political formation? That, that's an important question. And my hunch is that across religions, and where the question of encounter comes up, it, the answer would be different. Um, so, okay. Um, I, I thought I saw um, a hand. David, I think if you can ask very quickly, and then um, Ajay, if you wanted, if you had a, a response, Pratama as well, I just wanted to offer that chance. And then Pratama, you'll have like, Two minutes to respond, please. Yeah, if that's okay. David, please. What, we can't, David, you're muted. I want to follow up uh, on what Parto said in passing about uh, 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 Ambedkar's Buddhism as constructed out of English sources and as uh, uh, a sort of uh, idiosyncratic uh, uh, formation uh, that he created. Um, I wonder to what extent uh, this whole discourse has been surrounded by English and European and, by the way, American, William James and uh, John Dewey and, and so on, um, and how that has reached out into other languages, other discourses, uh, not only before Ambedkar, but in the tradition of Ambedkar, into uh, perhaps most specifically Marathi. And uh, Anu is better uh, uh, prepared to talk about that uh, than uh, any of us. But uh, uh, is there uh, a continuing intellectual discourse beyond English? and beyond the, uh, the realm of uh, English academic life. Uh, Jay, did you want to jump sure. in? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, Prasama, just, uh, you know, uh, I'm wondering whether it makes, you know, because what I found fascinating about what you're saying is that it seemed to uh, fit also into what might be called a negative definition or negative understanding of religion. Right? That is to say, rather than, as you, as you, you, you I think you, you know, I think the, the positive definition of religion can only take us so far, and it actually confuses more. Uh, but a negative definition of religion as a freedom without sovereignty or autonomy, following Derrida basically, opens up a whole new set of questions. Then one can see the kind of parallel conversation between philosophy and religion, right? where, religion where philosophy is about a freedom centered around sovereignty or autonomy in various ways, where even if you're thrown you know, we are in some senses seeking sovereignty over what we are thrown into, right? Uh, mm -hmm. where, whereas religion is marked by this constitutive gap with, from sovereign, even if there is a transcendent God who one treats as sovereign, you know. And I wonder whether that makes sense because I think this is something that, you know, I think for me, sure. yeah. So. Right. Atma, you will have the final um, word. Please take a couple of minutes. Um, and yes, um, um, thank you, uh, Professor Lelevel. It's an honor to meet you. I've been reading you all my life. Uh, thank you for your question. Well, in terms of, uh, I mean, the, uh, in terms of uh, Ambedkar's uh, 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 interest in um, American um, pragmatism and, you know, uh, uh, other things. There's a lot of fantastic work that is being done on that side of Ambedkar, and wonderful work on Ambedkar's library by Vigita um, Scott Stroud. Uh, anu, uh, his work on uh, the kind of 
Western literature that Ambedkar has been reading. That's a fantastic scholarship. Uh, and I'm not the person who can really speak at any great depth on that. Um, I wanted to highlight the other untranslated uh, Ambedkar, as it were, because that, I feel, falls through uh, modern uh, scholarly language, uh, so that I wanted to highlight that, and and you are quite right. Uh, Anu will probably uh, uh, know more about it, but as far as I can see, in the Marathi public sphere, uh, in Marathi, there is a lot of uh, interesting. For instance, uh, I can talk of somebody called Pradeep Gokhale, uh, whom Anu would probably know better than I do, who has. Uh, who's, who's a kind of quote-unquote vernacular intellectual, though he writes in English uh, widely, but he writes in Marathi more, and he's very, very, I mean, I have learned much from his reading of the, you know, touch, the touching points between Ambedkar and the older debates uh, amongst Brahmins and Buddhists and so on and so forth. So there is, there is, even though I would still say it's a minority voice, uh, uh, because the public discourse is very much a pain to modernity and the hope that modernity will finally liberate us even today. So, uh, you know, so there is that. Uh, so, and so that's about what I can say. And Ajay, thank you very much. I am very, you're right. I mean, I, I have, I'm, I am, have been reading you and I'm really interested in the concept of the non sovereign that you are developing in your work on Gandhi and now on Ambedkar. And I, yeah, I, I really want to think with you on that. So I'll just leave it at that because, yeah. Asma, thanks for a really brilliant, brilliant talk and wonderful engagement. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, thank you, uh, Kathy and Bill behind the scenes for, for everything as well. And thanks everyone. And thank you both. It, uh, it was just an amazing conversation. Thank you. My pleasure and honor. Thanks for having me.